So good afternoon. I have the pleasure to be your host today and present to all Professor Michael Schertz. Professor Schertz graduated from Harvard University in Chemistry and afterwards was at Stanford University, receiving a PhD in Chemistry in 2005 in the lab of Professor Vijay Pandey, where he was part of the team that started the Folding at Home project. He was an NIH postdoctoral fellow at Columbia and then started as a faculty member at the University of Virginia in 2008. In 2015, he moved to the University of Colorado Boulder, where he is currently an associate professor of chemical and biological engineering. Professor Church works to design and ca characterize new molecules and materials at nanoscale through the use of theory and computational. His focus includes the prediction of physical chemical properties, protein ligands by affinities, and properties of novel biomimetic materials. He is especially interested in the development of computational tools that can fundamentally change molecular design by making searches to chemical and configuration space much more predictive, reliable, and efficient. So welcome, Professor Schertz. Thank you, and please feel free to start your presentation. All right, well, thank you so much for that introduction. Let me uh, share screen. Uh, all right, there you go. Can everyone see it? Yes. Fantastic. Well, again, it's a pleasure to uh, have this invitation and to have uh, so many people watching. Um, it's uh, <laughs> strange situations, but I might not be able to uh, give a, a talk in Brazil under, under most other situations. So, uh, but it is beautiful here in Boulder. The, it, is a, it is not a, a um, actual uh, picture behind me, but what you see behind me is very similar to, to what I see with, uh, outside my window. Uh, mod uh, some, some trees and uh, a few houses in the way. Uh, you, I'm, I've been kicked out of my office since my five-year-old is doing kindergarten there. So uh, that's the way things are today. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, take a, the chance to do a, uh, have a little bit more methodological talk and you might hear a few, that's the three-year-old behind me. So uh, that's the world we're in right now. Um, I'm gonna take the opportunity to talk a little bit more, more about some of the methodological work we've done uh, given this audience than, than I'd usually do in a larger talk. So um, I'm gonna talk especially about not using histograms. That's one, one theme here. And, uh, but especially talking about uh, using statistics and statistical ideas to calculate thermodynamic properties from simulation. Uh, okay, so part one, first I just wanna give my complete overview of using simulations to calculate thermodynamics uh, in just three slides. So. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I will fit it in, believe me. Uh, so really all the thermodynamic properties we're interested in are ratios of highly multidimensional integrals over the coordinates. So here, for example, we have a free energy difference. So the small f is, is a free, uh, free energy, whether it's Gibbs or Hemholtz, as a function of some parameters. So that free energy difference is really just a ratio of two partition functions, which are integrals over these uh, very highly dimensional integrals over these coordinates. So uh, where the, uh, the, prob the sort of reduced probability of uh, combining your temperature and pressure and volume all into one exponential factor, um, it, 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 it exponential that, uh, you know, integrating the integral over all our coordinates, the ratio of those two are free energies. Um, yeah, so here's a free energy is a reduced Helmholtz, it gives free energy. Um, yeah, and, and the A is all the parameters of the Hamiltonian system, temperature, pressure, force field parameters. And all our expectations are also uh, ratios of highly multidimensional integrals. On the top, we've got uh, some um, observable of the system, could be volume, radius of gyration, that's a function of both the parameters and the coordinates. And now we just um, you multiply by the Boltzmann factor on top, and on the bottom, we're, uh, you know, we've got the integral over, um, over the Boltzmann factor, so our part partition function underneath, but really all the things we're interested in, free energy differences, um, observable averages, are ratios of, of multidimensional integrals. Uh, so what we can do is we use molecular simulation methods to perform Monte Carlo integration of these ratios of integrals. So Monte Carlo integration simply says that if we're interested in some integral of a, of a quantity times a probability distribution, we can rewrite that as a sum over observations where our observations are sampled from our probability distribution of interest. So we take something, we replace this integral with a simple sum over sampled points. Uh, which, you know, integrals in highly multidimensional spaces are essentially uh, impossible to calculate in, in, in general uh, situations. Only in very specific situations can you actually do that. Uh, 
Um, and so then we generate our, our uh, probability distribution using some type of Markov chain Monte Carlo. For example, molecular dynamics uses small collective moves with 100% acceptance, and that's how we sample from the probability distribution. You know, uh, essentially we're just applying Newton's equation of motion and solve the coupled partial differential, uh, differential, differential, partial differential equations by finite difference. Um, or, or we could use you know, a more direct Monte Carlo method. Um, but one fundamental problem we have with uh, generating samples from molecular systems this way is whatever the method, it'll usually have very long correlation times, longer than we can simulate in most cases. And so the next step is we need to identify improved ways to accelerate sampling through the multidimensional space of interest. So up to then, this has been pretty straightforward. There's one route, one type of thing we're doing, uh, but now, <laughs> To improve our sampling, this umbrella sampling, replica exchange, Hamiltonian replica exchange, accelerated MD, multi canonical simulation, adaptive biasing force, weighted ensemble, metadynamics. There's just a zoo of different ways to uh, accelerate sampling. And that's generally what one sees uh, in, in, in the literature is just all these different ways, you know, which is where the active research is, finding all these different ways to perform this sampling. Um, and then finally, uh, once we have improved sampling, we need improved, uh, we, also a lot of the research is identifying improved ways to estimate these multidimensional integrals given a set of molecular simulation data. Uh, for energy perturbation, Bennett acceptance ratio, WAM, MBAR, different approaches to, uh, uh, to get the information you collected and transform it into predictions of thermodynamic variables. So that's it, that, that's really everything we're trying to do uh, if you're looking at thermodynamics, I would say, argue is more or less captured uh, in this philosophy. So, so that's the approach we think about and we try to break down the different problems and, and fit them in this framework so we understand what we're trying to do and how we're going to accomplish it. Um, so one trick that we use a lot is an idea called important sampling. Uh, and, and you've probably seen this in simulations. You may or may not have uh, had it, seen it referred to by this name, but uh, important sampling originally came uh, in, it came from statistics. And if you're interested in carrying out this, this integral, remember we, we wanna carry out these multidimensional integrals, um, what you can do is you can do the thing that mathematicians always do, which is uh, multiply uh, by one, right? That, that's, that's the trick in, in all of uh, this case. So in this case, we, we multiply inside our integral the ratio of the probability of some other distribution. What other distribution? Doesn't matter. This should be valid as long as the two distributions have support in, uh, over the same uh, variables, i.e. The, the, the probability distributions are non-zero for all the x's that are of interest. Uh, and then you just rearrange it a little bit and you can see that now we have an integral that um, is, actually, can you see my arrow when I move it around? Yes. Okay, yes. Good. good, good. I just want to check that. Good. Uh, now we have um, our observable times a ratio times a different probability distribution. So now we can do Monte Carlo sampling with this different probability distri distribution. And we find that the same quantity we were interested in before, the observable O under some thermodynamic conditions, I, some set of temperatures, pressures, force field, is equal to the average of samples from our new distribution, this J distribution, multiplied by some ratio. So maybe there's some distribution, some sampling is hard to carry out, but sampling of a very related distribution is easier to carry out. Um, or, you know, we, we don't even need to carry out the sampling of our first distribution if we can carry out sampling from this related distribution. And so we do sampling from one distribution, observables from another distribution. Um, if this ratio is similar in magnitude as our uh, data varies, then we can avoid generating the whole, uh, the entire Monte Carlo chain. Uh, that is a big if though. It turns out that in many cases, these ratios are not very similar and this method doesn't work very well. Um, so the good thing is for physical problems, we know these distributions. We're given the distributions and we can do important sampling. We're interested in some variety of Boltzmann distribution. And uh, so we can write that in normal, this is the, the unnormalized form, it's proportional to the exponential, uh, but of course then we can write it in a normalized form because usually with probability, if you're working with probabilities, you wanna work the normalized, we, we normalize it by the partition function. And uh, what I like to write it in a lot of times, the normalized function uh, as exponential um, beta times the free energy times uh, minus beta times the potential energy. So now we've got uh, an entirely normalized distribution and it's just written as a simple exponential without any prefactor. 
So then, you know, we can find this ratio uh, and the ratio uh, at any given point is going to be uh, beta times uh, the difference in free energy minus beta times the difference in potential energy at that point. Uh, and since we have, if we're, if we're doing any sort of molecular simulation, we have formulas for computing potential energies. So this is straightforward with the one problem being, of course, we don't necessarily know the free energies beforehand. Um, one trick that uh, I, I like when you're thinking about this is, uh, well, what if you just plugged in the observable one? Uh, we know that the ensemble average of one is one, uh, exactly, and we, so we can plug in both sides and we get an equation for what those free energies would be. And it's probably this becomes something that's quite familiar. This is just a, a, the, the Zwanzig formula for free energy differences or you know, single direction FEP. There's lots of different names, but it says basically, if you know all the free energy differences uh, of all the points that you sampled, you can simply average those, uh, take the logarithm and get the free energy difference. And of course, we have, uh, the, the gives us, we, we can write out our formula for thermodynamic expectations as well. It, this is starting to get complicated, but really you can see that it's, it's simply a weighted average of the observables. We take each observable that we made during the simulation and weight it by a certain amount and we normalize uh, by um, our estimated partition function that we, you know, we get from um, the free energy differences. So, so we can calculate both um, free energies and thermodynamic expectations using important sampling. So all we really have done uh, up to this point is just put some of the formulas that are of, of general use into a, a, a framework of important sampling. That's, you know, a standard technique in statistics. Um, so then the trick comes, becomes, okay, let's just find, if we're, if we're interested in large numbers of property predictions, whether as you change the force field, we're interested in carrying out simulations, essentially multiple temperature, uh, calculating properties of multiple temperatures or pressures simultaneously, we just need to figure out the right reference distribution to use. You know, what choice of temperature, pressure, force field should we use in order to uh, efficiently calculate thermodynamic properties of interest? Um, so, you know, let's say we're interested in calculating the properties uh, of some function, uh, of some probability distribution that uh, has samples all along some coordinate x. So maybe we can, uh, you know, generate data from this, uh, this uh, from one Gaussian. It's very simple to generate, you know, data from this Gaussian. We gather information, but it's not very good at calculating uh, uh, um, the properties if you know, the true distribution samples values over here. You know, maybe we have a couple Gaussians and we say, okay, when it, wherever the probability distribution is highest, I'll use that Gaussian. But that, that becomes uh, sort of messy if you have to keep on making decisions about which reference distribution you use. Um, so the simple idea here is why not use all of them? Let's just carry out a range of simulations uh, uh, that, that have different properties that span different uh, configuration states of interest. So if we get sample, if we if we can carry out a simulation that uh, samples, you know, all the range uh, range of configurations of interest, then we can simply add them together. This is a perfectly well defined distribution. Um, it's uh, you know you just let's say they all have equal numbers of samples. You just average them all together. Now carrying out a molecular simulation with this mixture distribution is very hard. If you've looked a little at the uh, concept of enveloping distribution sampling, this basically try, uh, uh, those ideas are simulating, uh, doing mixture sampling of, of two related distributions. Um, so it can, it can be rather challenging to actually simulate the mis mis this mixture distribution. But to generate samples from the mix mixture distribution is easy. You just sample each of the components of the mixture and add them together and there's a mixture distribution. So now we have a distribution that does have samples everywhere we care about and we can important sample from that mixture distribution. Uh, different numbers of samples, it's easy to generalize it. You just wait by the numbers of samples. If you carry out more simulations in one than the other, then your mixture distribution you know, will look like this if it happens to have you know, more of one than the other. So, so, that's, so we, we have the idea of important sampling and then we can generate by carrying out a set of simulations, the entire range of things we want to um, uh, reweight. Uh, we have a distribution that we can rate reweight to any property of interest. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, 
MBAR, so this, some people um, on, on this call might have used uh, the multi-state Bennett acceptance ratio, a concept that, that we developed a, a while back with, with some of our collaborators. Uh, but one thing I didn't really fully appreciate until afterwards, you, know, you never actually understand what you do until much later. Uh, MBAR is just important sampling from the mixture distribution. So here's the equations you might generally see for calculating free energies and getting at calculated expectations. But if you look at the denominator here, it turns out that it is exactly equal to the mixture distribution, where each of these POKs are your normalized probability distributions. Now it looks much more like the reweighting formula. Here we've got the free energy over here. We've got the energy of the uh, evaluating each point at the energy of the state that we're interested in, and then we divide by the mixture distribution that we sample. Same here for the expectations. You have the uh, a normalized probability of uh, your um, uh, observe uh, your each configuration uh, in in that state divided by um, the normal uh, divided by the mixture distribution. So so that's what it is. MBAR is just important sampling from the mixture distribution. Um, we presented this idea earlier, but you know really the same idea had been floating around with just a little less justification. Uh, Bartels. Uh, came up with something very similar to this. Uh, Rue and Sewell came up with something similar to this. I think we just put it on a, a little firmer um, theoretical foundation. Uh, this is, you know, other people come up with other varieties. I think the uh, name I like least is UM, uh, unbiased weighted histogram analysis method, which I'm not quite sure, no, un unbent, not un unbiased, unbend weighted histogram analysis method. I'm not really sure how you have an unbend histogram method, but anyway. Uh, so, but, but it's the same concepts. Uh, and so this reduces to, uh, you can show where, where we got our original name for the Bennett acceptance ratio uh, for two states or bridge sampling if you're using statistical language. Um, uh, weighted histogram analysis method in the limit of zero width histogram bins, you get the same formula. You don't get some of the advantages like uh, uh, formulas for uh, uncertainty, which are really nice. Um, you could also show that it's the maximum likelihood estimate of the data collected. Um, and you can prove that it's the lowest variance reweighting estimator of all possible reweighting estimators. Um, we have an efficient Python implementation, uh, PyMBAR, and uh, which you can download and use. And uh, yeah, and so uh, if you're interested in sort of ex these concepts of mixture distributions, how it relates, uh, there's a preprint out there. This is a couple pages I never quite found a place to put into a publication, but it's out an archive because it didn't really fit anywhere as just a pet few pedagogical notes, but you can read that for a little bit more on the relationship between reweighting and important sampling and uh, an MBAR. Okay, so what useful distributions can we sample from? Great, we've got this formulation for reweighting to different mixture distributions. Uh, we can, you know, you know, we can divide in terms of like the properties, what the reference distributions would be and what our target distributions would be. So you could do a temperature scan, for example, that you only carry out simulations at a few temperatures and you get properties at all the temperatures. So you can get some very clean heat capacity curves uh, with just a few, um, a few samples. Uh, free energies of binding, you have a coupling parameter that says how, um, you know, what, how um, present the interaction between your ligand and your protein is. Uh, and then you carry out a few simulations and you can calculate your free energy uh, as a, um, a function of all of those. So, so you get your free energy differences between each lambdas and can construct a free energy of binding uh, from that. Uh, potential of mean force, reference distribution is a bunch of umbrella biasing potentials and your target distribution is what the unbiased potential mean force is. Um, parameter scans are something that can be fun. If you have a, a bunch of force field model parameters, then you can evaluate uh, new, product, new model parameters without having to perform the simulations nearby. Um, so one problem is these properties are often computed by histograms. Uh, you know, here's sort of a restatement of the weighted histogram analysis method, which has been around for a while. Uh, let me walk through some of the notation here and why there, it can be problematic. So uh, here in notations, the I, and this is important, the I labels histogram bins, where you count how many samples uh, uh, in a given biased state that is biased or, or you know, has some coupling parameter dependence. Uh, and then to, uh, the, um, yeah, so K labels the bias states and I labels the histogram bins. And your N of I is your count uh, that, that occur in that histogram bin. 
where the hist histogram can be any, um, any degree of freedom uh, that, that one is interested in calculating free energy over a potential mean force, a lambda temperature. And then the PI labels the unbiased probability distribution in bin I, and the F of K labels the free energy difference in bias state K. And so what you end up having is a set of um, equations that you solve uh, self-consistently simultaneously. But there's a few problems with these. Uh, if you look at this, uh, this the, the bias potential is the same everywhere in the bin. So if you choose your bins uh, in, uh, in a way that isn't optimal, then you end up having uh, the same biasing weight everywhere in that bin. Um, also, is you have the same probability everywhere in this bin. Say you're calculating some, potential, some free energy surface, uh, then uh, everywhere uh, in that histogram, you're, you're averaging out that probability everywhere in the bin. Uh, so there's a couple problems with this that, and if you're very careful with it, you can avoid these by, you know, making sure that your bins are narrow enough, but then you have a problem if you, uh, you know, don't have enough data, then it, it, it uh, starts to, to become very noisy. So um, other problems in multiple dimensions, if you wanted to do scans in more than one parameter at the same time, the number of histogram bins required scales with resolution to the dimension. So, um, you can almost always avoid these problems in 1D if you're careful and collect enough data, it becomes more problematic in higher dimensions. So, um, so what's the fundamental difference here between WAM and MBAR if you're looking at properties? Um, the way to think about it is that you're essentially calculating some sort of density of states in WAM. It's a histogram, uh, can, be, can be used to compute properties by you know, summing over the bins, but again, you're averaging over bins, uh, uh, which, which is an approximation. MBAR is essentially, you could think of, a bunch of delta functions, a bunch of weighted delta functions that gives every sample, uh, if, you, if you sample it in a probability distribution that isn't very much like the probability or your in distribution you're interested in, say you're sampling with an umbrella bias, uh, then if your umbrella, umbrella bias, if you need to apply a high bias potential in order to force the point to be there, then when you remove that bias, it will have a very low weight. Whereas if you don't need to apply it much bias at all, then it'll have a relatively high weight. So you take all the samples you sample everywhere and you add a, a, a just your, you, the, that's a delta function. And then you add a weight corresponding to the state you're in. So every sample that you carry out everywhere gets weighted according to how much it belongs in your current distribution. So um, it's your probability distribution. It's not really a function because it's some delta function. Yeah, yeah, technical doesn't really matter in the end. Um, it's not good for visualizing, but what it is good for is computing integrals in high dimensions. Because since we know that if you integrate a function times a delta function, you just get a, 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 a function evaluated at the point the delta function is located. And so therefore your integrals turn into sums. And so that's the way to think about it is that you take your, the simulations that you gather, uh, you're using only the information from your observations. You're not smoothing them out in any way. You're taking that information, weighting it properly, and then all your integrals becomes these sums. We've seen this idea before. You know, when you're doing Monte Carlo integration, you are um, uh, uh, turning your integrals into sums. So this is just another way of stay, we're sta saying we're stating our integrals into sums, it's turning our integrals into sums. It's we collect our simulations and have this empirical distribution of what we uh, collected. We don't have a continuous distribution, but we wouldn't want to make it a con continuous distribution because that's not the information we have. We want to take the information we have as purely as possible and turn that into our predictions. Um, yeah, so here's some examples of how histograms can result in significant bias. Looking at a propane, di propane dihedral angle, and this is from, if not from our group, from other groups. Uh, if you don't have enough bins, you can see the gray is sort of the true answer and the green is with WEM, is that you tend to underestimate barriers and you overestimate the basins uh, because of the way the, you know, the ex exponential averaging works. Whereas using um, you know, proper weighting here, you get, um, you get things that are most, much closer to the exact answer. And there's still an approximation in here because you're bidding a potential mean force. So that approximation is always here. But WAM uh, has the additional approximation that you smooth out uh, your, weight, your, your, your probabilities uh, in the process of reweighting in the bins. And you don't want to do that. You want to be using the bins only to discretize the total amount of probability, not to estimate the probability. Um, so MBAR, we think it's great. You know, sometimes it's only marginally more great. You know, I have to be you know, clear here is that many people have come out 
with ways, uh, first of all, it's been rediscovered like three times. Uh, second of all, people have come up with ways of getting around ways of doing things. Um, you know, we have a benchmark test for free calculations that I developed with uh, my student at Himachu Paliwal at the time, you know, just with some easy cases, disappearing methane, and hard cases like disappearing anthracene or, you know, reversing a large dipole. Um, and so what we actually did is, you know, we're very interested in making sure that our uncertainty estimates are good. So we did all these calculations a hundred times and compared the analytical uncertainties with the actual sample variance. These are analytical uncertainties with, with 10 different free energy methods. Uh, and so here, um, you know, to be clear, the, these are uncertainties. So the error bars are error bars in the error bars. Um, and so what we found is that um, the analytical estimate of M bar down here was, was quite good and uh, uh, bar had a couple issues that frequently are not that important. Uh, bootstrapping, I don't know if you've used bootstrapping. Bootstrapping is really useful as well. So you, know, you, you see here that M bar, you know, uh, thermodynamic integration, bar and M bar all have about the same uncertainty. So if you're careful, you can get good results. You know, single direction exponential averaging has, has more issues in many cases. Um, so yeah. One thing, just sort of a side note here, it's not part of the main story, is that bootstrapping can be really useful to estimate uncertainties because it works, you know, just about as well as the analytical estimates and the, um, the actually carrying out the full sample standard deviation. I can talk to people more about that, but I highly recommend that. So, so is it like a panacea that solves everything? No. Is it a nice way to think about things that makes everything simpler and straightforward? I would argue yes. Um, so. Uh, some of the fun things we've done, we used a reweighting to rapidly validate simulation parameters for free energies. So, you know, uh, if you're doing some sort of molecular simulation, there's a lot of parameters you have to choose. Like, you know, what's my, the cutoff going to be? You know, how does my free energy differ if uh, I change the cutoff uh, for, for Leonard-Jones interactions? So here, you know, if I'm carrying out a single simulation, I have to carry out a, a bunch of simulations as I gradually turn off the interaction between the molecule and its environment. Uh, so if I wanted to, you know, see what the um, results would be at a bunch of different simulations, I'd have to carry out all the alchemical simulations with all the different cutoffs. Uh, but of course, if you're just changing the cutoff a little bit, that's very similar to simulating with, um, I, th they're all very similar. The probability distributions are quite same, are, are almost the same. Are they going to make some difference? Of course, they're going to make some difference, but not that much. Your probabilities are going to change by, I don't know, maybe 10%, 20% for each sample, which is perfect. It means why do you bother reevaluating all these things if you could just do it, um, rerunning the simulations if you could just do it directly. So that's what we, uh, we went out to do. Uh, we just carried out like one set of, of simulations uh, at a given cutoff, and then calculated what the effect would be uh, for all the, uh, what the sensitivity of our free energy calculations would be at all the other states. Um, yeah, so you can see just, you know, three-dimensional example of, you know, free energy is uh, differing from some very expensive reference simulation as we change the PME, uh, E-well tolerance, a bunch of different things. So I think we looked at five variables simultaneously, uh, three different Coulomb uh, variables, and then Leonard Jones, both where your switching function occurred and how wide it was. So, uh, so, so here is, I think, sort of the, the, the core of this. So here I've got three notations. This, this gets a little complicated, so I wanna make sure I, I present this well. The initially si initial simulated steps. So we just ran one set of simulations that some reference uh, cut set of cutoffs. We have expensive parameters where we turn, you know, super long cutoffs, super expensive PME, you know, end up being like a 30 times slower than the simulated state. And then what we were trying to find is optimized parameters, parameters that were as close as possible to the expensive parameters, but much cheaper. And so we, that's, so we, we just simply scanned over all the possible ones and uh, saw you know, what, were the, what were the fastest simulations we could get that were still within some bound of the expensive simulation. So the idea is you're carrying out initial state sampling. You have an optimized state you don't know and an expensive state you do know. And the idea is you're trying to estimate this free energy without ever doing any simulations of either of these states. You're only evaluating individual configurations. All the sampling is done at the initial state. So, um, you know, if we looked at anthracene, this is just bringing like 14 heavy atoms. That's pretty big. So these were our predictions using the benchmark state. We found that, you know, what we originally chose was about minus 0.6 kilojoules away from the most expensive. Does this matter? Mm, on the edges, it, 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 it does. It, it could affect things on the edges. 
And so we predicted, okay, you know, these set of optimal, this set of parameters will be optimal. Uh, the free energy difference will be well down in the noise here. Uh, if you do the direct free energy differences, this is another example of why this reweighting re is nice. The other problem you might have guessed that if you're trying to find the difference between two things that you expect to only be difference by less than a kilojoule, your noise is enormous for these simulations. So it's very hard to tell uh, which set of parameters will be right because you'd have to run them for like, you know, 100, 200 nanoseconds, even for small molecule solvation. So, um, but these were our predictions of the benchmark set. And then when we actually did the calculations, we found that, you know, we were able to get numbers right on with reweighting uh, that you could not have done with direct simulations. Uh, and this is a, a particular statistical trick, is that the key, uh, the variance between subtracting two for energy differences is going to be the sum of their variances minus the sum of the covariances. So if you do independent simulations, you do not get the covariances. But if you do reweighting, you do get the covariances. So you can make these very fine distinctions between these uh, two simulations you never carried out. Uh, whereas if you'd actually just carried out the simulations, you know, without you know, just analyzing in a straightforward way, you wouldn't get that same information. So I think it's really cool, sort of the subtle things you can do to get really useful and good thermodynamic information out. Um, okay, uh, I, I'm, I was particularly proud of this, is that, you know, without ever ca carrying out simulations of this, we got the right answer to within hundreds of a kcal. So I thought that was cool. Um, yeah, so it can be used to fill out a multidimensional thermodynamic space. So this is actually work done by at least, I think all three of the authors are on this call right now, uh, where they used MBAR, they, they carried out a number simulation and used MBAR to fill out the rest of uh, the surface so that instead of having just a few simulations here, there, that a, a smoother, smoother surface, this is particularly useful for doing two-dimensional work where, um, you know, if you're trying to carry out simulations at every grid point, as your dimensionality goes up, it gets much worse, but, but MBAR allows you to fill in that, that data uh, particularly well. Uh, one uh, thing I liked about this is, is a particular phrasing of this is that it can be seen as a numerical equation of state. I thought that was a, a quite a nice way of thinking about approaching this. You know, we have lots of other numerical equation of states in engineering. Uh, here's one that's actually rooted directly in the data. So um, I thought that was cool. And we've, we've kind of uh, done a few examples of things like that since then. Um, so PyMBAR is our Python implementation of reweighting. We've, we've, we've tested it quite a lot and, and found many, many ways that you can fail numerically uh, and tried to write around those. People still occasionally find ways to make it fail numerically. Um, so fast, robust, efficient. We've got many examples like potentials and mean forest, salvation for energies, forced by a single molecule experiment. So it turns out you can actually use this to uh, understand forced by a single molecule experiments as well. Um, automated setup and installation through Conda, which is nice, uh, hosted uh, one of our collaborators, John Kadera, in their lab. Um, we're working on a 4.0 version that, you know, has a lot of bells and whistles, better free energy surfaces, um, uh, you know, JIT and JAK speed ups. Uh, uh, so anyway, um, but it works really well right now already. Uh, and there's additional tools that, that can use it, uh, a chemical analysis. Uh, actually, you should probably be using MD analysis version, MD analysis version of, of the implementation now to, to use this to cat, do free energy calculations. Um, yeah, so uh, we can use this techniques to scan molecular simulation parameters. One other study that was really cool that was done with uh, Levi Naden, a graduate student in my group a few years ago. Um, let's take our example of Leonard Jonesium solvated in water. You know, what's the free energy of a Leonard Jones sphere in water? Um, so if you're interested in that as a function of two different parameters, you have to carry out quite a lot of simulations. Um, so let's just start out with 10 molecules linear in volume space, uh, and then predict the free energy of solvation along the 2D grid of states. And what we can see is just using reweighting that we can calculate the free energy uh, of, of this two-dimensional space quite accurately. So I have here on top the free energy of salvation of that Leonard Jones sphere with different sizes, and on the bottom of the, un of the uncertainty. The, the, the nice thing about the formulation, it gives you the uncertainty as well. And you can see over most of the space, uh, we have a good estimate, but you know, down at low volumes, we didn't really get good sampling of low volumes. So we said, hey, you know, looking at this, let's stick in one more reference state. Um, hey, if we just add uh, one more sam uh, F reference state here, all of a sudden we go down to um, you know sub k cal per sub tenths of a k cal per mole sampling everywhere. So we just carry out these thirteen simulations. Uh, uh, oh no, actually we added 
three extra points. That's right. Um, no, no, uh, no, the extra sampling was here. The other three points are just examples of, you know, where those Leonard Jones spheres uh, might be related to, like neopentane would be approximately equivalent to that. No, 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 methane down here, a C60 sphere up here. So with just 11 simulations, we can we can capture all these effects and start looking at uh, um, smaller effects as you go through. So I thought this was a nice example of how one can do these parameter scans. Um, yeah. So yeah, calculating 28,000. Now once we've done once we carry out these simulations, we could calculate you know 28,000 salvation free energies in about one hour. Um, so I think what was even cooler is what about ion salvation? So for ion salvation, we looked at, you know, 51, I've got plotted here because I'm going to show a movie, 51 to the third values of charge, sigma, and epsilon. Um, and using some clever adaptive techniques, basically just rooted in uh, what uh, you saw before, that we looked at the results, figured out where the uncertainty was high, and added more states there. Although Levi uh, did an awesome job at like re redoing this as like, uh, finding where the uncertainty got bad as a, a computer vision problem of, of edge detection, which I thought was awesome. Um, so we only needed two, 200 simulations, only about 3,000 CPU hours. And uh, on top, uh, as you see, if you've got a key, I'm going to play a movie, the, key, the charge will change. So we, we, we spanned, you know, sizes and epsilon, epsilon from essentially zero to 0.8, uh, sigma from a 0.2 to 0.9 nanometers, so a huge range in size, and then charge from minus two to 0.2. And you see the uncertainties are below half a, uh, half a kilocalorie per mole everywhere. So uh, yeah, so we can actually calculate the free energy of essentially all ions, and we've done it in just, you know, a, a, with a small, uh, relatively small amount of computer work. Um, yeah, because you only need 200 simulations to do it. Uh, why should you? Why should I care that you can do that fancy pants calculation? So what? Uh, well, what this would allow us to do if we got around to it. I, I, I still haven't had a chance to, to sit and think about it. If anyone else would like to think about it, I'd love to. We can, we can test salvation for, ener uh, salvation for energy to analytical theories of unprecedented levels of detail. For example, uh, can look at the difference between explicit salvation and born salvation theory. So down here, um, I've got the difference between the free energy from, you know, Leonard uh, charged ion in tip 3p water, the difference from uh, uh, born salvation theory, and you can see the charge asymmetry effects coming out. Uh, that there's going to be a charge asymmetry because water is asymmetric. You know, it's, uh, a Q minus uh, 1.2 and, and 1.2, there, there shouldn't be a difference in born salvation theory, but you can see, uh, you know, this, this significant difference in the free energy. So this is something, you know, we haven't had time to do, but if someone would like to sit down and, and, and use some of these ideas to understand salvation theory better, that would, that would be great. So this is something that uh, we think has um, good applications here. Um, Reweighting can help clarify what it means to compute a free energy surface. So I'm going to just take a cut, it's been, hmm, I'll, I'll take about 10 minutes to go through these. Uh, so, you know, what does it mean to compute a free energy surface? This is another use of, of reweighting a lot is where you're interested in some free energy as a function of, of a collective variable. Uh, and essentially, one way to think about it is you take the, it, it's the Boltzmann distribution, but only evaluated for configurations that, that match a certain uh, set definition. For example, if you're looking at the free energy of a torsion in a complicated molecule, uh, you know, it, the free energy is a function of all of the uh, degrees of freedom, but you're interested in only the, the free energy uh, as a function of, you know, one degree of freedom with the rest averaged out. Um, so for finite sampling, usually you'd replace this delta function saying, I only want my uh, value this constraint, it replaced by some sort of indicator function. So rather than using a delta function, use something that looks like a delta function, like histogram bin, a kernel, some sort of triangle shape. Uh, and then you perform Monte Carlo integration using some sort of MD and MMC, and your free energy will simply be the sum of those observed indicated functions. Uh, there should be one over N over there, but essentially it's the average of the indicator functions and can be any number type that you want at all. You know, if, if you, as long as you're willing to accept a little bit of bandwidth, then, then it'll work out all right. Um, but the problem is, of course, uh, you, you get no data in the mountain ranges. You don't get any data where you sample looking at barriers. So the solution that everyone has used for a long time is to collect data with bias simulations that forces it to go uh, where the barriers are, where the simulations usually wouldn't go, and then uh, remove the effect of those biases. So you essentially are performing some weighting. Um, that weight will depend on your bias. 
And then all you need to do is determine the weights from the K umbrella functions that you use and then construct a free energy surface. Um, but the th I think the key is they should be two separate steps. And when you use something like WAM, determining the weights and which indicator functions you use get mixed together. Um, yeah, as I've shown this slide before, but just a reminder, the, the problem is the biasing potential is the same everywhere in your bin. So even if your biasing potential is somewhat steep, if it's steep compared to your bin, then you get, um, you get errors. Uh, and uh, also again, everywhere in your bin, you're accumulating the sign probability. You can't tell the difference if you have you know, bins, if, there, if there's some gradient that occurs between you know, 175 degrees and 165 degrees, and that's all within the same bin, you don't pick that up. It just averages it out. Um, yeah, so here, for example, using, if you have a lot of data set, WEM and MBAR, uh, potential of mean force. I'm, I'm, in this situation, I'm using potential of mean force and free energy simulation. Identically, there's some subtle differences between the two, but for the purposes of this talk, I'll just use them interchangeably. Um, for 72 bins, look great, but if you use 18 bins, you get uh, differences that are, that are much more significant. So the free energies should be determined not for bins, but for each umbrella simulation alone, which has nothing to do with the number of bins. You know, if you have you know, 26 bins, then you should be determining 26 free energies, not free energies for each umbrella, for, e you know, for each bias for each bin. Um, and then the weights should be assigned to each sample, not for each bin. Um, so I showed this slide before. Basically, histogramless weighting has clear advantages, potentials, and force. So a better way to think about the problem is what do we actually collect when we simulate? Again, you know, we don't, if I'm interested in the probability as a function of some collective variable averaging out the rest of the data, uh, we don't get a smooth curve. We get a bunch of delta functions. Like this is what we observe. We observe a lot of samples here where the probability is high and very few samples where the probability is low. Uh, you know, and this, yeah, I, I, I put like a Gaussian on there. I can see I can start to approximate that, but just adding a Gaussian is somewhat unsatisfactory because it, you know, it, it adds this uh, amount of smoothing. You know, I can add more smoothing, but then you see I start to get the, uh, the, the, the estimate wrong at the edges. This is too broad there. So we need better ways about going from a uh, discrete distribution to a continuous distribution. So what do we collect when we perform simulation biases? We don't collect continuous probability distributions. We collect a bunch of, uh, um, you know, here, oh yeah, so here I've added a harmonic bias at point one. So I forced the data to accumulate here. Here I've added a harmonic bias at point six. I forced the data to accumulate there. Uh, and so these are the samples I get out. A lot more samples here, a lot more samples here, a lot more samples here. Aha, now I have a lot of samples all throughout this. So what I do is combine them. I, um, I find the weights of each sample using MBAR, taking into account that biasing factor, and this is what I get. Uh, and this is really cool because it encodes information in two different ways. The way that the dense probability density is encoded is both the, um, uh, the height of the barrier, so not the height of the barrier, the, the weight of the sample, and the density of the samples. Both of it in, can, contains these two types of information. So um, then we can take this and turn this into a, this is our empirical probability distribution, and we can turn it into a continuous probability distribution by finding a good, good way to combine the weights and the densities together. Um, so how do we generate a continuous distribution close to this thing? Like, fine, yeah, what is the continuous distribution that is closest to that? And that turns out to be a very subtly uh, hard problem. You could argue that in some sense, the continuous distribution that is closest to that is, I put a Gaussian with a, a width so small I can't see it at every point. And that is very close to that distribution and not very useful because it still goes up and down everywhere. Um, but what you can do is you can construct, you can quantify a distance in terms of something, this case is a distance of a kohlbeck liebler uh, divergence which is a, a, re, a very reasonable way to define different distances between distributions. Um, and this QK uh, can't be an empirical distribution function because you're dividing something by the zero in a lot of places. So, but the probab this, this probability of the top can. So if we plug in our empirical probability distribution as P, and then Q can be whatever trial distribution we're interested in, we end up uh, something that looks like this. Uh, we, the distance from our empirical distribution to our trial distribution, that is just a sum of this ratio uh, evaluated at every sample we've sampled. Uh, so this is now an optimization problem that is parameters and theta. So what we, do we represent our empirical distribution by? 
anything we feel that's reasonable, smooth, not too many parameters, no, histograms, we could use histograms as well if we wanted to. Uh, the point is we can use anything that we want to. You know, kernel density uh, estimates are one, Gaussian mixture models, splines, anything that is reasonable. And so uh, um, Lee and York had some nice uh, variational free energy perturbation method that came at it from a different direction, but, uh, but, but uh, it inspired this work and is closely related to it. So I want to recognize them. So you know, here's an example of several different cases. Here um, we have 26 umbrellas with varying constants, 500 data points per umbrella, um, which is just the data you see in the pi bar distribution. And we can fit with say, you know, 14 or 16 cubic cardinal splines, and we get continuous distributions that are as close as possible to the original distribution. And the uncertainties are bootstrapped here. So this is nice. That allows us to push all of the decisions just into exactly how we represent distributions. And hey, how to represent distributions? This is something that, you know, the machine learning people have been thinking about for a lot. So we can borrow in a lot of their ideas that have been coming up recently. Um, there's a maximum likelihood interpretation. You could also view this as a maximum likelihood problem as well. So the likelihood of a given order per collective variable, uh, xi, given data theta, um, which ends up being just a, pr a product over all the points, times the probability of our trial distribution um, at the, the values we observed, and then to the power of the expected number of times we saw that. But that exact expected number of times is just the weights that we saw. So we simply, so, so the KL divergence can be seen as exactly the same thing as a maximum likelihood. What is the likelihood of getting the data we actually did get if our probability distribution was our trial one? Um, yeah, so I won't go through the derivation, we're running out of time, but they're the same thing. Um, how do I know how many parameters to use to over avoid fitting? People have been thinking about this. There's this uh, uh, the Akake or Bayesian information criteria. There's a couple of formulas for doing that that are functions of the parameters and the, um, the number of samples. And so plotting this on the previous example, you can see that you can minimize your uh, here. There's two different versions. I'll mention that briefly that we've looked at, but basically one is the red and one is in blue. Uh, but you can see that there's points where this uh, Bayesian information criteria or Akake information criteria is minimized. And if you look at these PMFs, the red line is at too few parameters. And um, then starting in like the blue, the blue line just has a couple more parameters, you know, four more parameters than the red line, but falls on the data exactly, you know, just as good as any of the higher number of parameter splines. And then the same in this case as well, you can see that um, the right number of splines tends to go you know, right where the other methods do, where if you have too many or too few, you can overfit or underfit. Um, there's two different choices for which empirical distribution to use. You could reweight from K umbrella samples to unbiased empirical distribution. So, and find the op, an optimal continuous free energy state for one distance, the single distance between this and the others. You could also find a single continuous free energy state that when you bias it, has the lowest information from the bias distributions. This has ended up being a little bit better. Um, Given that it's maximum likelihood, there's a Bayesian imp implementation. So I collaborated with Andy Ferguson at University of Chicago to get this right. Again, a Bayesian inference would be, um, you know, parameters theta, data set E. Uh, this is just the same as the likelihood we maximize. So you take that likelihood and you include a prior that allows us to encode things like the smoothness of our model. This is the power here that, you know, if, uh, yeah, I said at the beginning, like, how do we decide if it's reasonable? You can encode your, this is a reasonably smooth function into the prior. Uh, and then we get out of prob posterior probability distributions of our parameters, including both all of the information from our simulations that we get in the likelihood from MBAR and all of our thinking about what it means to be a good uh, smooth function into the prior. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we played around with this. This is a paper that just came out uh, earlier this year where we actually use uh, MCMC in model space to look at um, probabilities of potentials of mean force. And what you can see is that, you know, here on the left side is one where we didn't impose that bigger prior. Uh, and then we, we uh, that allowed it to verge more. And, you know, on the right side where we, we imposed prior. So a Gaussian penalty on the difference between spline coefficients. So um, yeah, and the heavy line is the maximum likelihood. So you can, you can see sort of the distributions of results you get out from a Bayesian space. A uh, current idea that we're playing with now, because splines were slow, uh, representing these as Gaussian mixture models. So this is work at Annie Westerland, who's 
uh, a, a grad student, uh, but who's basically her advisor's like, ah, this is too complicated for me, but, or not too complicated, I'm sure she did. This is, this is something that I don't have the time to figure out, but this student is fantastic. She, I bet she could do it. And so she's actually been working directly with me on, on how to uh, fit these to Gaussian mixture models effectively. The nice thing about Gaussian mixture models, unlike splines or histograms, is it work is easily generalizes into multiple dimensions. So just here's an example of an alanine dipeptide potential of a uh, free energy surface using um, um, representing it with Gaussian mixture models. So um, I guess the summary here, multi-stint reweighting re is integrate. I'm sort of bad pun. It, it really is a different way to think about Monte Carlo integration to get thermodynamic properties. A multi-state reweighting is a powerful formalism for calculating lots of quantities more efficiently. Um, thinking about MEMBAR as reweighting for the mixture distribution makes the brain hurt less. Uh, check out this archive to think about this. Um, they're good Python tools to get out the calculations. And uh, really, one should think carefully about what one is doing when calculating potentials of mean force using reweighting methods. We should be looking at continuous potentials of mean force rather than histograms that have multiple problems. Um, so acknowledgements here, um, I'd like to thank all the help and support from my group, um, especially a lot of the work I presented, the really cool applications of MBARs uh, due to uh, former graduate students in my group, Levi Naden and Himanshu Paliwal. Uh, Levi's now a, 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 a software scientist at Molsi and Himanshu Paliwal is an assistant professor at IIT Ropar. Um, external collaborators, I mentioned um, Andy Westerland and Andy Ferguson uh, helping with some of the potential mean force work and John Kadera and Ji Kuang Tang for some of the original MBAR work uh, and funders. And uh, I would like to put a just a very short plug in for live comms, the living journal of computational molecular science, which um, the idea is it's a peer reviewed journal for papers that can and should be updated uh, with things like uh, best practices for molecular simulation, high quality tutorials, computational comparisons, lessons learned, perpetual reviews. I think things like this could be a, a living journal for this is a good replacement for um, scatters of book chapters from here and there. So um, first two issues published last year, upcoming issue soon with a blockbuster paper by about 15 different researchers on best practices for free energy calculations. I think it's gonna be cool. So um, thanks for your patience as I probably went a little long. Um, I would be happy to take questions. You know, if, if a bunch, bunch of people have to leave, um, I can take questions you know, after um, uh, the seminar as well, because uh, I've got a few minutes after. So yeah, that's, that's what I have, and thanks for putting up with my fast talking. So I'll shift to the summary slides. Thank you very much. For the interesting presentation. Between here and our YouTube channel, you've got almost uh, 80 simultaneous viewers, and you're now open for questions. If you want to ask one, please enable your microphone or write down the chat and read it. And our YouTube viewers can write down also. So anyone want to make a first question? Professor Fred, I think you are muted. I'm saying don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> we have many participants from outside Brazil today. I think my group is on, just, that's, that's a few people. Can I ask a clarification? Please. Okay. I'm sure it needs many clarifications. <laughs> uh, Professor Schertz, very interesting. You made a passing comment about binding energy and the uh, space of lambdas, coupling parameters. Yes. I was wondering, see, most of the people use the auto-docking methods to calculate the binding energy. It's yes. popular everywhere. So how do you reconcile a simple auto-docking with the multiple coupling parameter thing for, say, a protein? Binding energy, is there some guidance you can give us this? Yeah. What is the so, best way of doing that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll put on my other hat of having spent some time doing binding free energy calculations and, and talking a lot to pharma people. I mean, Autodoc is an approximation, right? It's, it's a approximating a binding free energy by finding a uh, most low, low, a low energy with a lot of wiggle parameters in there to try to capture free energy into that. Um, there was a nice study, it's pretty old now, from people at GSK, which basically showed that docking was useful in enriching hits. It's like if you, if you try to correlate 
stocking score with whether something bound or not. You could toss out a lot of bad things, but that the correlation coefficient with binding free energies was essentially zero. Again, that doesn't mean there's no information there. It just means that uh, all you can really do is throw out the bad ones. So that, that's what I'd say for docking. It's, it's, it's an approximation that can be useful if you have a million compounds and you want to throw out 900,000 of them. And have and, and have a much richer data set, but it's not going to give you a binding free energy. So, how do you sample your multiple lambda coupling parameters? They are all discrete. There seems to be no distribution between the coupling parameters. Oh, there's uh, there's a million. I mean, there's, there's there's so many ways that people develop to do this. Um, you can always jump between lambda states in a, in a Monte Carlo process. And if your lambdas are closely spaced enough, which for a ligand of you know moderate size, 10 or 15 is plenty uh, to have overlap between those states. You could do Monte Carlo, you could do Lambda Dynamics. There's a bazillion ways to do it. That's part of the zoo. There's, there's so many ways to do it. So uh, read the paper that's coming out in LiveCom soon. <laughs> we'll tell you everything you know about it. But, but in, until that comes out, you can read Niels Hansen's review, which is probably the best one previous to that. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you then. So you don't believe in any of the binding, auto-docking binding energies? Oh, it's useful. Like I said, if you've got a huge number of compounds to screen and you're on auto-dock out, then if you take like the top 10% or 5% of what's in auto-dock, those compounds are much more likely to be binders than the ones you toss out. It's just that if you want to get it within three or four kilocalories per mole, it's useless. So it's not useless, but it's not the correlation is very low with the true binding free energy. Okay. Pharma and, companies use it a lot of time to throw out unlikely possibilities and, and narrow it down to things that are more likely. So about chemical reactions, if you want to go out to activation energy, is there any possibility of doing such things? If you're doing any, chemical reaction? What, what we'd love to do is to get things like estimates of, of potential free energy surfaces you know, cheap enough such that you can do a, uh, you know, ab initio MD to, you know, do those sorts of calculations. And there are a lot of people who are, who are making great progress along that. We, you know, I stick with classical force fields because uh, I, I'm getting old enough that I can only learn a limited number of uh, new tricks. So, uh, so we'll focus on the analysis uh, in classical simulations, but this could all be done with quantum as, quantum as well, but it's very hard. But, but lots of people are making lots of progress in that area. So you feel someday you can do a chemical reaction with uh, W bar type of sampling? Oh yeah, people are doing it now. Yeah, I mean it's it's, it's very expensive, but it can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. No, thank very you. Very interesting. <laughs> okay, somebody kicked it off now. That now there should be more questions. Oh, hi, this is Fernando. And Fernando, oh, it's going to be a good question. Okay. Yes. <laughs> the thanks a lot for the presentation. I think it was um, very instructive and very pedagogical. It was a lot to digest, but it was <laughs> really good. Uh, so I had a question about, uh, do you have one of the examples where you said that, so uh, you wanted to use uh, this method to find an optimized parameter set? Yes. That initially, you know, some initial choice of the parameters, and you have uh -huh. an expensive uh, set of parameters, and mm -hmm. the optimized one that you wanted to find. Mm -hmm. So, in principle, um, the optimized parameter could be for something that's more coarse grained than the expensive parameters, right? Yes. I mean, as long as the set that you're simulating, so, as, as long as those trial distributions, the optimized distributions, uh, have sufficient overlap, then yes, it, it can be. It could we, be. Yeah. Absolutely. We just mm -hmm. used ones that were, um, you know, it, the exact same functional form, but we were just wiggling around with accuracy parameters like cutoffs. Right. But uh, uh, my one worry with if one goes too coarse grained is simply that the overlap isn't good enough. Right, right. Uh, but so if it's good enough, is there any connection with this method and the maximum entropy method? Ah, yes, yes. Let me think, let me think. Uh, I'm pretty sure it is because that uses uh, kohlbach liebler de ah, Okay, I sat down with Scott Shell once and, and worked this out. Uh, the answer is yes, it's very related, uh, but I'd have to, um, 
I'd have to I'd have to recollect when I worked that out with him before. I can't remember now. I can't remember exactly what the differences are. Those are two probability distributions, but but there, there's a subtle there's a subtle difference in there because you have to take into account that the spaces are of different uh, magnitude, right. and um, there's a mapping there that. Um, I, I see. I knew it was going to be a good question. Uh, <laughs> I, I'd have to think a little more about that. Um, I, I worked out the details at some point, but it, there's, there's there's that subtlety of different dimensional dimensionalities there. Okay, great. Thank you, Michael. Uh, hey, Michael. Uh, I have a follow-up uh, question from yes. Vic. By Fernando, um, when you analyze, um, when you do like reweighting, uh, and you analyze uh, the system in a different state. Uh, in this case, you have like the system in the same um, space, in the same configuration space, but mm -hmm. with different like model parameters. Yes. But, uh, if the system is coarse grained, you can have like. Uh, a lower dimensional space in mm -hmm. which you want to to uh, analyze your system. So how you do this uh, in MBAR when you have like different configuration space? That's a great question. So this is not set up to handle the differences in configuration space. And this is sort of where the relative entropy comes in. You're sort of trying to, to, to the, 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 the subtlety I talked to Fernando about. This is not really set up for that. Um, I've, I've, we've, in my group, we've devo developed a set of theories for non-overlapping configuration spaces that have the same number of degrees of freedom. But if there's a different number of degrees of freedom, there's some fundamental issues here that, um, that these great questions are reminding me that I thought about a while ago and, and didn't, uh, didn't come up with clear answers there. But uh, that, that's a great question. I should, I should revisit those previous, th if anyone wants to think about that, we could sit down and think about that afterwards. So maybe after I'm done teaching general chemistry in a hybrid manner this semester. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just just a, a little comment. Um, you said that it's difficult to, to simulate the, the mixture distribution. Uh, yes. You mentioned the enveloping distribution method. Mm -hmm. uh, but expanded ensemble is it's also a way of um, uh, sampling the mixture distribution, right? If you do like uh, Monte Carlo sampling. Between no, that, that, that's a great point. That's a great point. When, when I said it's harder to sample it, the mixture just uh, expand ensembles is, is, is definitely a way to do it. I was thinking of a more restrictive case that you were trying to simulate it with a single Hamiltonian. And I should oh. clarify that. So enveloping distribution sampling, you know, concepts like that, try to, in a single Hamiltonian sample, the entire mixture distribution. So thank you, I should clarify. Expanded ensemble, does give you the mixture distribution in a single simulation by switching between Hamiltonians. Um, what's very hard is to sample it um, in a, as, as a single Hamiltonian. So thank you for helping me clarify that. Okay, thanks for the talk, great talk. <laughs> I also have a question. Mm -hmm. um, first, thank you for the for the very nice presentation. Uh, you said that in point. Yeah, sampling. O op open your, your camera, please. <laughs> well, I don't have the I don't have the camera set up. Oh, right sorry. Now. Okay, okay, okay. I do have yeah. a camera, but it's it's positioned in a way that you can't see. <laughs> okay, okay. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned that important sampling can break if you, well, if you don't, if you don't have enough overlap between yes. states. Mm -hmm. But is there any case where it can break because you have tricky properties? You want a tricky observable, like a property mm. which has a, a very sharp distribution in each state you choose to, to sample. Okay, so let's see. So. One, that, that's a great question. Uh, one thing that I caveat a little bit there, you said an observable that has a different distribution in each state. Uh, usually we're interested in observables that are not functions of state, like the, that are not explicit functions of state. Like the density is a function of the state, but the average isn't carried out 
over that and like the energy and yeah, that's okay that that's not clear i i'll let me i'll skip that i won't go for that um so let's just say can i think of a particular property of distributions that i mean so my ipad is not charged it's not your ipad is not charged oh i didn't lock the door ian i have a talk right now do you want to come say hi <laughs> okay. Can, can mommy can get it for you? Okay. Can you ask mommy? Ian, go ask mommy. Okay. All right. Close the door behind you. Okay. Yeah. See you later, guy. Bye bye. Okay. Cute. Yes. Cute. <laughs> He's a very cute kid. Um, I can be I, a little more. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry, I got Let's distracted. For, for instance. Um, we are currently using AMBAR to, mm -hmm. to estimate properties on unsampled states. So yes. mm -hmm. it works very well for, let's see, and it, I call them reweightable properties. So mm -hmm. energies you can reweight from one yes. state to yes. the other. Mm -hmm. But if we try to use it, for, for instance, for density, which mm -hmm. is, well, it, you can't change the your set of parameters, but you have one configuration, the density is the same. Yes. Regardless. Yes, so yeah. So, it, so how- It kind of needs a lot more samples for the, for important sampling to- Yeah. Work out. I, I, I would argue not so much. I think, uh, uh, well, so let's, uh, so it's a different situation, but uh, what you're essentially doing is uh, as you can only reweight to densities that you observe. So let's say that I'm interested in, uh, calc I run a simulation. And I'm interested in calculating a density at uh, um, a temperature that's 20 degrees higher. Uh, so what I know, it's probably going to have a lower density. The configurations that I sampled with um, that are lower than average density will get higher weights. And the configurations I sample with um, higher than average densities will get lower weights. So um, the a, a principle is reweighting is you can only reweight things you see. So, um, th so that's how it works with something like density is that, you know, if it's at a different temperature, if that temperature does not contain a contain, it's, it, if it's ensemble contains things that are not observed uh, in the simulation you're, you're, you're working with, it, it won't work so well. Um, but, but observables that are independent of energies are very possible to reweight. It's just it's, it's the, the overlap uh, uh, is, is exactly true, is that if you're trying to, you can't, you can't reweight to a state that you've never seen anything like. You have to get um, some samples there. So, you know, let's say that uh, for the density of something that uh, has a, okay, density, it's a lower density state, uh, you need to be able to get at least some samples into the, um, higher range of there. Not as many as the real simulation one, but at least some in. So, so uh, in principle, I could try to tweak, let's say, the the barostat and and change the relaxation time to, let's say, force the system to oscillate to to, to oscillate in a that's a great larger question. range. Yeah, that's a great question. I wouldn't recommend that though, because if you do that, you're probably breaking the distribution. You need to make sure that in any reweighting that you do, you know the distribution. So for example, uh, the Berenson Barista, the weak coupling Barristat, uh, does not actually give the right distribution. It, it gets pretty close if you're careful, but if you're not careful, it's quite far. And so actually, if you apply reweighting using that, you can have some problems because it's not the Boltzmann distribution. However, if you have some sample that's non-Boltzmann distribution, as long as you know what that distribution is, you can, of course, reweight. So it, it, there's nothing in any of the theory per se. There might be coded into the implementations that's the Boltzmann distribution, but the general principle applies for any distribution. So I guess what I'd say in that case, you're probably better off, um, you know, what you need to do is include more density. I mean, the, 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 the fundamental problem that you just cannot reweight to that which you do not, which you have not seen. All it does is allows you to, um, to do it. So, so what you need is to find some way to spread it out 
your density, collect more data at more densities, which means you probably want to use some so sort of you know, expanded ensemble in temperature or pressure that you had a method that did collect data over a wider range of densities or, or just simply shorter simulations at a large spanning the space such that you do have access to the densities you're, you're interested in. Okay. But yeah, so, so, so really I would claim that no, that's actually a, a problem of um, uh, an overlap problem. Um, you're not visiting the states that are relevant if you do conditions of interest. Though that did make me think about what are the observables that it has the hardest time on. And if you have observables that are important, where your observable depends on the rare events, on the very tails of the distribution, that could be a potentially a part where, um, where um, reweighting has a harder time because it would need to get samples out to the edge of the distribution. Mm -hmm. And if you carry it, simulations at one temperature, you're interested in properties here, but your property depends on the tails. It's going to have a hard time doing that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That's, that's also exactly the answer. I was try weighting molar vol I would suggest this might, it'll help just help on the margins, but reweight molar volume. And then after you do the reweighting, take one over that to get the density or molar, you know, whatever mass volume, uh, do the volume rate, reweight the volume, not the density. It behaves a little nicer than, than reweighting the density. Okay. Th that's Thank not you your problem, much. though. That's just a minor. <laughs> That'll help a little bit. <laughs> okay. Thank you for pushing me. <laughs> it's good to be forced to think. Uh, Theodore F. I was going yeah, to go ahead and jump in. Um, hi. Hey, Michael. Hey. Um, I, I was wondering, um, I guess, so the, the, the question of sampling seems to come up and is there like a good rule of thumb way to determine if you have enough overlap between your dis probability distributions for any of these given methods um, yeah so there, there are and um i'd refer people to the uh, to 2015 paper that i wrote with uh, uh klimovich and and mobley uh and uh what you can do is you can look at the distribution of the values of the weights and if the, the sampling is poor, what you'll see is instead of having lots of weights that are roughly the same size, or you know, maybe you have a thousand samples and you know, in a given state, you see that there's maybe a hundred weights that are significantly different than zero. That's pretty good. Uh, if you get to the point where you look at the weights that come out of MBAR, because you know, every single sample gets a point. If you get to the point, there's only five or six weights that are significantly different than zero, that's bad. Um, so if only five or six samples are contributing, then realistically you only have done five or six samples. Yeah. So as a, as a rule of thumb, we've, uh, and you can turn this into something, there's an equation um, called the, um, that, that's discussed in this, this 2015 paper, that's called the, um, uh, a KISS's estimate of the effective sample number. And if the effective sample number drops below 50, then the uncertainty estimates of MBAR start getting off. Um, if you don't, if you don't have enough, the one an annoying thing about the uncertainty estimates is MBAR is that the uncertainty estimates get worse faster than the value gets bad. So that's not good because then your guidepost is gone. But as a rule of thumb, if your number of effective samples is, is 50 or higher, you can trust the uncertainties pretty well. And, and I guess, is there any way to gauge that before even running MBAR? No. Like maybe no. looking at energy overlap or? I uh, mean, can, can... Mike, can you repeat the question because it's very, very uh, oh, low. Oh. The, the sound. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah. So, so the original question is, how do you know if there's bad overlap? And I talked about some ways you can extract information out of MBAR that Pi MBAR does. You just look at the documentation of Pi MBAR, and it, it says how to do that. The question is, can you tell beforehand? Um, I mean, the, the MBAR you basically do for each configuration. You have to evaluate what your probability would be in your, the probability of your old samples are in your new distribution. Without evaluating that probability, you can't tell. And then once you've evaluated the probability, then the rest of the math is essentially like milliseconds. So no, I think that's the best, the best way to do it. Obviously good physical intuition will, will partly get you there. But in the absence of that, then these uh, calculating the number of effective samples in your new state is, is the, um, I would say that the best way to do that. 
I guess I, I was coming at it from a point of having done replica exchange simulations where at least you're using uh, energy overlap as a mm -hmm. gauge of whether you're exchanging replicas well enough. I'd assume if you're exchanging replicas well enough, you'd have um, decent enough overlap um, mm -hmm. to, to perform an MBAR. Absolutely. And, and actually, the, uh, the criteria is less stringent. Mm -hmm. So with replica exchange, you want to have overlap that maybe it switches 20% of the time. As a rough rule of thumb, maybe 5% overlap is good enough to get good averages, mm -hmm. has, been our has been our experience. Awesome, thanks. <laughs> thanks for all the good questions. Yeah. I can take another can I ask one. a general question. Yes. You mentioned about number of parameters, AIC and BIC. Yes. What is your opinion about it? One seems to be more restricted than the other. Yeah, I don't have enough, quite enough opinion about that yet. I, um, yeah, I don't have enough opinion. I, I, I'm, still, I'm still formulating an opinion. Uh, Bayesian information criteria seems a little, you know, includes a bit more information and is a bit more restrictive. I generally prefer more parsimonious models. So I would lean towards the one that has fewer parameters, which is usually Bayesian, but they're pretty similar when the number of data points is large. So I don't, I don't know. I, I don't have an opinion. Ask somebody who's studied this for longer. <laughs> Use no, you, one of them. Use the, one of them. <laughs> Use at least one. No. Yeah, but, but if I had to pick, I'd say whatever is more parsimonious, whichever has fewer parameters would be better. Thank you. Uh, can metadynamics be, oh, I see a chat question. Uh, metadynamics be regarded as a, a method to get a mixture distribution with a single Hamiltonian MD. Um, could it, I, you know, metadynamics, I'd put metadynamics more in the space of, um, in the space of expanded ensemble where you're, it's just you're continually, continuously jumping between uh, states. Remember each each simulation that you do. Yeah, so uh, maybe I mean to some extent it gets to be a, a distinction without difference. Like does it really matter? I don't know. Um, I, I would argue that still it's you're jumping between uh, because you have a fixed you carry out MD with a single fixed bias and then you update the bias. Uh, so and it's collective variables are complicated. I didn't get into like the difference between collective variables between a a restraint or a weight. Talk to Fernando and, and Charles Abreu about how you def defining distributions by reweighting or by restricting the degrees of freedom. They can, they have written extensively about that. So, eh, I don't know. I think this is where um, I, I've tried a couple of times to get together a bunch of people to write sort of like a review on the zoo. That let's just let's 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 just classify the zoo. All these different ways of accelerating things. And um, I don't know. It's it would allow you to do it. So yeah. I'm sorry if that's much, much of an answer. I'm not sure if it's an important, important question to answer. <laughs> yeah, I think it's time, no? Uh, no, I think it's okay, so, about time. Uh, thanks everyone for, for all the questions. Thank you, Professor Michael Schertz for the great My pleasure. presentation. So let us uh, let us all thank again, Professor Professor, for the presentation. Thank you. Thanks. And thank you thanks so much for listening. And